to tell you relationships are critical in Washington. But how do you, A, find out who the key players are and B, figure out how to reach out to them? Well, I want to tell you about Leadership Connect. It's been an absolute lifesaver for us as we expand our operations and outreach here at Washington Tech. Leadership Connect, it's the digital service used by top federal contractors and government affairs leaders to contact decision makers and develop those strategic relationships. Visit leadershipconnect.io and join the community. I love it, and I'm 100% sure you will too. That's leadershipconnect.io. Try it now. Well, racism can be more explicit in some online spaces than it is in person. But on the other hand, we also see examples of um, people using technology to promote resistance against racism. And so it's kind of two sides of the coin. And, and, and I, I look to tell kind of a, a balanced story about the effects of technology on how we experience racial discourse. Welcome to the Washington Tech Tech Policy Podcast. The latest tech law and policy news and brightest tech law and policy experts wherever you are. So you can stay in on the move in less time. From Washington, D.C., it's the Washington Tech Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. Joe Miller. Facebook and Twitter thwart a major attempt by Russia to target and influence African Americans. Facebook's under fire for not doing enough to address misinformation ahead of the U.S. Census. And Rob Eshman is my guest. Hey, everybody. Facebook and Twitter announced late Thursday that they had taken down multiple accounts and pages that were in the process of executing Russian interference campaigns targeting African-Americans. Unlike during the 2016 election when Russia conducted similar operations from inside Russia, these latest intrusions prove Russia's persistence and evolving sophistication. Russia disguised these latest interference efforts by conducting them from within Africa, namely Nigeria and Ghana, by recruiting operatives there to spread vitriol and suspicion around topics like Black Lives Matter, voting, and police brutality. The Hill reports that Facebook dismantled 49 accounts, 69 pages, and 85 Instagram accounts. Twitter said it removed 71 accounts that purported to be operated from within the United States. So an ad ran on Facebook that looked like it was a link to the U.S. Census. But when users clicked the link, they were redirected to Trump's campaign website. Senator Kamala Harris blasted Facebook in a letter last week for failing to stem the tide of misinformation on the platform, even misinformation that violates its own policies. Nancy Pelosi also blasted the social media behemoth. Harris pointed specifically to Facebook's dismissive approach toward recommendations made by civil rights groups to address the effects of census misinformation on people of color and other marginalized groups who are vulnerable to being undercounted. Facebook has since removed the ads, but what were the lessons learned back in January when Facebook was forced to remove misleading ads about the coronavirus? Facebook continues to mismanage information that appears on its site and isn't being held accountable in any sort of lasting and effective way. Kamala Harris noted as much when she said the company's response to misinformation about the census will presage how it responds to the 2020 election. Last month, The Atlantic predicted that misinformation will be a defining factor of Trump's re-election campaign. That certainly appears to be the case thus far. The Hill reports that the Federal Trade Commission has warned Cardi B and 10 other celebrities about not disclosing paid ads for their endorsements of things like supposed weight loss teas on their social media channels. The FTC didn't file formal charges against the influencers. However, it has required them to provide a list of actions they plan to take to be more transparent about their sources of funding. About Twitter, first, its CEO, Jack Dorsey, will stay on for the time being. Prior to the announcement, there had been speculation that activist investment firm Elliott Management would require Dorsey to step down due in, port, due in part to perceived conflicts of interest because of his role as CEO at both Twitter and Square. But Twitter was also caught between Republicans and Democrats as it came under pressure to take down or flag a video that Trump retweeted which appeared to depict Joe Biden endorsing Trump's re-election campaign. Twitter ultimately tagged the video as manipulated. Then a couple days later, the Trump campaign followed up about an ad posted by the Biden campaign, which included footage of Trump calling protesters on both sides of the deadly Charlottesville riot, 
which included far-right protesters opposing the removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee as fine people. The Biden ad took that quote and made it appear as though the president was only referring to racist protesters. So Trump wanted that taken down as well. Finally, a new report from cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike finds that cyber criminals, including a group connected to China called Pirate Panda, are taking advantage of people's fear and confusion about the coronavirus. The report notes that just like the coronavirus, the attacks are moving east to west, becoming steadily more sophisticated as they progress. Security breaches are designed to cajole unsuspecting users to open email attachments and take their actions take other actions consistent with previous criminal operations that malicious hackers have conducted against unsuspecting users. You can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Stay with us. Washington. The inclusive voice of tech policy. Because America won't stand still for the same old insiders. 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 Washington. Moving the needle. My guest today is Rob Eshman, Boston University School of Social Work, faculty member since 2017. Dr. Eshman is a scholar and teacher whose interests include educational inequality, community violence, racism, social media, and youth well-being. His research seeks to uncover individual, group, and intuitional level barriers to racial and economic equity. And he pays special attention to the heroic efforts everyday people make to combat those barriers. His recent publications include Unmasking Racism, Students of Color, and Expressions of Racism in Online Spaces, which appeared in the journal Social Problems in 2019, and Rethinking Race, a chapter in the book Education and Society. Rob Eschman. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So I took a look at your work, and I'd never seen or considered the impact of the virulence we've seen online and how it affects students in particular. I think folks would would love to hear an overall synopsis of your scholarship and how policymakers are addressing or falling short of addressing some of these issues. What are we looking at here from 30,000 feet? Yeah, yeah. So broadly speaking, my work looks to investigate the ways that technology changes how we experience race and racism. Um, so on one hand, thinking about how some online spaces may facilitate uh, more explicit language um, around uh, race, right? That, that um, uh, racism can be more explicit in some online spaces than it is in person. But on the other hand, we also see examples of of um, people using technology to promote resistance against racism. And so it's kind of two sides of the coin. And and, and I I look to tell kind of a a balanced story about the effects of technology on how we experience racial discourse. What are your interest areas sort of broadly in terms of the effects of technology, social media and access when it comes to young people? So I'm really interested in understanding the relationship between the real world and the digital world. So often I think we see those things as being separate, but I think that online interactions can teach us something about ourselves, about society. So in my research, I use a combination of methods, some big data analysis, some survey work, some interview work, um, because it's not enough for me to study online processes. I want to know how real people interact with those online processes. Um, I'm also very concerned with resistance and how marginalized people have used technology to change what resistance looks like. So right, one example of this during the civil rights movement, one school of thought was that if America saw the way that the blacks were being treated, if they saw the dogs attacking the police, beating nonviolent protesters, that then they would say, oh, you know what, we're not OK with this treatment and we need to change things. Right. And so civil rights activists would often work and, and be intentional about getting the media's attention. But then we, we know that traditional media gatekeepers do not always want to tell stories about racial injustice. Um, and so 
it can be difficult to get their attention around social issues that, 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 that we want them to pay attention to. So this change with social media, um, where black Twitter, um, folks of color on Twitter can amplify justice activities, whether or not people in power want those things to be amplified. Um, and I'm also interested in exploring an interpersonal level. I think that this applies to everyday interactions where racial power structures can make some people uncomfortable with challenging uh, racism in everyday interactions. People of color might be worried that they'll offend their friends by speaking out. Um, but online, we see different patterns, different norms. Um, and sometimes folks can use technology to make themselves feel more comfortable with challenging the types of subtle mass racism that have become normal. So how does does online racism and hate speech, how does it differ from hate speech in the past? Racist language was ugly and overt. Um, it was in your face. Norms about what language around race is acceptable have changed. So in most mainstream settings, overtly racist language is not seen as being appropriate. So this can make it more difficult to recognize racism. Some folks have made the mistake of thinking that racism is a thing of the past, something that was solved with the civil rights movement, right? And they use Obama's proof. If we had a black president, how could racism be real? Thankfully, many scholars have studied racism that's embedded in friendly interactions or race neutral policies and the ways that racism can be reproduced by well-meaning people and institutions. So I call this masked racism. It's hidden. But on the Internet, there are many spaces where racism doesn't seem to be masked. If you look at comments under a YouTube video or news article or accidentally find yourself on a racist website or even see kids singing the N word on TikTok, you see that the norms about racist language online are a bit different. So I call this the unmasking of racism. But we also have powerful examples of communities of color harnessing technology to engage in acts of resistance. The most visible example, of course, being the movement for black lives and organizing against police violence. So in terms of how social media policy makers are addressing these issues, um, social media platforms all have their own strategies for moderation. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Schools, I found, are also developing social media policies. Schools used to think that online spaces were not part of their jurisdiction, but recently those things have been changing. Harvard revoked admission for students a few years ago that were caught engaging in hate speech online, and that really showed that schools might be capable of letting students know that the standards of behavior they expect on campus it might be applied to their behavior online. But for the most part, I'm not sure we know what to do with those spaces. And the temptation is there for, the, for us to see them as being less real than in-person interactions. It's ugly, but it's separate. It's different than the real our real society. And it doesn't actually reflect our values. But I think a closer examination will find that it does have meaning for how we understand race and racism in the real world. You wrote a paper last summer entitled Unmasking Racism, Students of Color and Expressions of Racism in Online spaces. Tell us about your mm -hmm. findings. Yeah. So um, in my paper, Unmasking Racism, I explored a college campus, which I call MidU, that was home to an anonymous campus based website where explicitly racist messages were common. Um, I conducted interviews with students of color at MidU to understand how do people of color experience, interpret, and respond to more explicit expressions of racist um, ideologies in online spaces. So while students were used to racist content on random internet spaces or on social media, they were bothered by the site because the comments are coming from their peers, not random trolls on online. And because those comments often reference specific people, groups, or places on campus. So there were four main effects that I found, um, that I found that the, the site challenged students in, in several different ways. So first, the site challenged students' worldviews, especially when they thought that racism was not that big of a deal on campus. So for students who were happy with interracial relations on campus, the site was like a shock to the system. They couldn't believe that there were other students on campus with those types of ugly racist views that we would associate right with old fashioned Jim Crow uh, racism. So second, the site challenged how some students responded to racism. Students who saw themselves as being, as being skilled at identifying, challenging, and avoiding racism on campus um, suddenly weren't able to respond the ways that they were used to. They didn't know where the racism was coming from because these posts were anonymous, so then they didn't know who to rally against, who to organize against. A third, another group of students believed that the website challenged their relationships with whites. They became less trustful of their white peers, noting that anyone could have hidden behind the post on the website. 
Is this person in my class one of the posters? Um, when someone sits next to me in the cafeteria, right, they're thinking to themselves, is this, could this be some, one of the people who didn't like, how, right, uh, uh, um, um, or, or could this be one of the people who made an ugly comment online? And then the last uh, group of students were those who felt validated by the site. Um, they had long, right, these are students who understood racism. Um, they knew that racism was on campus, but then they struggled to communicate that to their peers or their professors. And so for them, the site challenged dominant understandings of racism, like the belief that we're living in a post-racial colorblind world, um, which, right, and so for them, the site was evidence that, that race was still significant. And so, right, my argument here is that racism, which had long been masked by colorblind norms, subtle interactions, unconscious bias, or covertly embedded in institutions is being unmasked through online racial discourse. So online environments that are characterized by increased anonymity, less moderation, and fewer perceived social consequences than in face-to-face -face interactions can structure or add more explicit expressions of racism. And these findings, right, although they come from one school, I think can provide insight into the ways that technology can shift racial discourse in other contexts. And you can access this paper by texting unmasking to five, five, four, 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 five, five, and then three fours. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of your early work and try to tie all of this together. Stay with us. work, Rob, was on hip hop, an art form that uh, took decades to be taken seriously. Now everybody listens to the roots, but <laughs> where do you see hip hop and, and the far side? But where do you see hip hop and and technology coalescing in terms of how they affect young people? Yeah, yeah. So I've done two big projects around hip hop. So the first um, was looking at um, hip hop right artists and the ways that online messaging, which we could see as being posturing, can turn into real world violence, um, and the way that um, violence prevention workers can use social media to better intervene and target their face-to-face -face intervention. So really looking at the connection between hip-hop, violence, and social media. And then second, uh, while I was in grad school, I developed a curriculum that used hip-hop to teach young black men critical consciousness, civic engagement, and anger coping in schools. And so I taught kids how to rap, how to record and edit a music video, um, and then they had those final projects that they could, which were music videos which they could share with their friends and family. <laughs> Um, and so I, I love hip hop. I think it's a great teaching tool. I have to be careful when I talk about how hip hop affects young people. Um, you know, I think that hip hop can have an effect for better or for worse, but then um, it's dangerous to generalize that effect on a broad scale, right? Do I think that hip hop causes violence? No, I don't. I think that we know that civic, civil neglect, extreme poverty, and lack of opportunity, that's where violence comes from. Not hip hop, not video games, right? And so does hip hop sometimes promote violence? Yes, but so do movies. And we don't blame Hollywood for violence in under-resourced communities. I don't think we should blame hip hop either. Um, so for me, hip hop is an art form that I love. And I think it has so much to say about struggle. Um, and, and because of that, that there's, there's a lot that we have to learn from it, right? So I think you could teach a, a class on social stratification using most deaf or Yazin Bey's song mathematics. Um, and, you know, I still try to teach with hip hop. I have a lecture around um, Vince Staples, a young artist, and the way that he talks about the emotional toll of racism, um, right? That, that he, he, he talks about what it's like to be a black man and have um, a crowd full of, of white folks who are chanting the N-word along with his, his, musics, his music. Um, so, you know, I think that it's a powerful art form that speaks the truth into many different situations. Um, and I think that, that um, it can be used to, to help students grow. Um, and, uh, um, and it, you know, it's interesting that it's changing now, right? With independent artists being able to use the type of technologies, right? Social media, getting, getting their own followings that allow them to, um, you know, go around the label machine. So some of the same processes that we see with activism and resistance against racism, right? We see with hip hop as well. So what do you say to, uh, to people who think both movies and hip hop promote violence yeah yeah you know I, I think what I would say is that that 
If that were the case, then we would be seeing equal violence in all communities that, that were exposed to that type of music and those types of, of movies. Because it's not the exposure to music or the exposure to movies that causes the violence. It's the lack of opportunity. It's poverty. And right when, when there is when there are no legitimate jobs, then people turn to the illegitimate economy. And then right when you're involved in the drug economy, that's where violence may come from. So I think that if, if, if um, high violence communities had more resources, Sources, they would have lower violence. And so there's nothing different culturally going on in a high violent community and then, you know, uh, um, a community with low violence. The difference there is going to be about economic and social resources. What should policymakers do to address some of these challenges? And from a First Amendment perspective, how would they how would they achieve those ends without content regulations that have the potential to go too far? Um, I would say that the number one thing is to, to make a distinction between freedom of speech and hate speech. Hate speech is something that we can tie to um, real world violence. And that's, that is not, I, I don't think, what freedom of speech is meant to protect. Social media platforms can do a better job of making themselves places that are not such comfortable homes for white supremacists who are looking for places to, to, to talk about their their ideology. Um, but then, you know, on top of that, I, right, I think that racists will always find ways to, to um, you know, to spout their ideas. And, and if that's going to be somewhat unavoidable, then we need to think about what do we do to, to uh, negate the consequences. We know that exposure to racism has a negative impact on wellness. And so then what is it that we can do to intervene when people are exposed to the types of hate-filled messages that are going to have a negative impact on their health or mental health? You know, some of us who, you know, I have, I think I have a few more gray hairs, just a few more gray hairs than you, not that many. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we feel like it, sort of each generation is sort of approaching this de novo. A lot of us feel like we've been talking about this, and it seems like yesterday when Jessica Gonzalez at Free Press, for example, and I were just starting out uh, our policy careers and talking about making the distinction between legit content and hate speech. And now, yeah. now, yeah. now, uh, a new generation of scholars and policy professionals and judges and, and lawyers are coming into the into the into the fray and making those exact same arguments. How do we deal with the fact that we haven't really had any tangible outcomes? And how do we kind of get to a place where we're actually making legit, substantial, tangible change so that the next generation is, is taking on the, you know, the next layer of what we need to do as opposed to constantly being in a position of, of addressing these issues from the beginning. When you say these issues, you're referring to this freedom of speech versus hate speech. Exactly. Kind of, uh, yeah. See, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, going forward, how we figure how we make a tangible impact so that the generation that comes next will be able to take that project forward on the next work package so to speak instead of being stuck and having to constantly kick the can down the road on uh, on addressing these problems yeah i think that this debate about free speech has had different motivations at different points in time right and so the one of the reasons why colleges and universities are so um concern with free speech right is the the history right when we have the kind of the the red scare and the and and you know um professors faculty members being able to be punished for their political views if they're seen if they're labeled a communist right um and that is completely different than the than what the debate is now now the way that freedom of speech is operationalized is something that protects the people who are the most privileged what I mean by that is that when you have kind of a classroom setting where we say, listen, we can say anything in here. And because we're going to have this intellectual free speech discussion, it means that no one has the right to be hurt by what anyone else is saying. This is going to be dispassionate. It privileges folks from the dominant group who can talk about issues of race and justice in a way where they are not allowing marginalized folks to be hurt by what is said. 
Um, and so I think that that's the big issue here is that when we think about who does this freedom of speech protect, um, it ends up protecting folks, privileging folks who are less vulnerable than, than other people that may be in that room. Yeah, it's kind of this double edged sword for this concept of tolerance. You know, well, who's doing the tolerating? Right. Because, you know, sort of inherent in that is the idea that one group is, you know, the rabble rousers and there's some other objective group that's doing the tolerating. Yeah. Leonardo Zeus has a paper where he talks about the effect of safe spaces on college campuses. But safe spaces, right? People talk about like this is a, a space where we can have a discussion and no one is going to get mad at anyone else here that we're we're just going to have this discussion but those safe spaces are only safe for white students um, and it protects them from being able to be challenged for something that they may say that may hurt students of color think about right where are these that the people who typically benefit from our current right the way that we currently articulate standards around freedom of speech end up being the dominant group because that prevents them from having to experience challenges on what that oppression might look like on campus. A lot to tackle here. What are some final ideas you'd like to leave with us before we close and tell us where we can find you online? Uh, so you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm at Rob Eschman, E-S-C-H-M-A-N-N. Um, you can also check out my website, robeshman.com. And then, you know, my final idea is I would say that I, I often get asked about, right, the effects of social media as if I could generalize in one way or the other. Is this good or is it bad? And I don't think I don't think it's good or bad. I think people use it in different ways that social media could be the place for folks to go to anonymously share their racist ideas. But it's also a place where, you know, the technology can enable new acts of resistance. So I think our job is to find ways to lessen the harmful effects of online experiences with hate and then find ways to further empower and bolster student um, resistance efforts and, and young people around the globe who use technology and social media to challenge the dominant structures that they see having a negative impact on their opportunities and their life chances. Rob Eshman, assistant professor at Boston University and author of Unmasking Racism, Students of Color and Expressions of Racism in Online Spaces, which you can access by texting UNMASKING to 55444. That's UNMASKING to 55444. Rob, thanks for joining me. Thanks again, Joe. And that concludes episode 222 of the podcast. How you doing? Are you washing your hands? The CDC recommends 20 seconds of washing your hands with antibacterial soap for 20 seconds each time. So hand sanitizer is a backup. I live in Fairfax County. I can't sing, find a single bottle of hand sanitizer. I don't know. So we had to cancel our conference on March 25th. Now it's scheduled for September 29th, assuming we're all still alive. I'm sure we will be. No cause for alarm. Just want to give you a heads up on that. Yeah, so that's it. I'll see you back here next week. As always, take care. 